so my name is uh, Daryl Tan. I'm an infectious diseases physician and I'm a clinician scientist at St. Michael's Hospital and at the University of Toronto. And most of my research as well as my clinical work focuses on, on HIV infection, particularly issues of HIV and sexually transmitted infection co-infections or relationships, uh, as well as biomedical HIV prevention, notably uh, pre and post exposure prophylaxis. So PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, technically the term PrEP could be used to refer to any product that a person who is at elevated risk of acquiring HIV uses and starts using before an exposure begins, so that's why there's the pre in the name of it, uh, but typically would continue after that risk of exposure as well. Uh, and the goal of, of using any form of PrEP is to, of course, decrease the risk that if a person actually is exposed to HIV, that that results in an actual HIV infection taking hold. Uh, typically though these days when we use the term PrEP, we're, we're referring to specifically the use of uh, two anti-HIV medications together uh, in a pill form. So tenofovir diazoproxyl fumarate together with emtricitabine. Uh, those two medications have been combined in a single pill. Uh, many people know it under the original trade name, which is Truvada. Uh, but here in Canada, for the last uh, couple of months, it's now become available as a number of uh, generic formulations as well. I think it's changed uh, this landscape of HIV prevention in, in a lot of ways, um, and mostly for the better. Uh, the a key thing to keep in mind about PrEP is that it's, it's really the first time we've had a biomedical intervention that's uh, available that HIV negative people who are at risk of acquiring HIV could take control of it and use on their own uh, on their own terms to prevent the risk of HIV uh, acquisition. Uh, you know, we've historically relied for HIV prevention on a lot of uh, more traditional methods around behavior change, which are still really, really important. Things around, um, you know, just thinking about uh, partner numbers, thinking about um, condom use as a, as a means of uh, you know, introducing a barrier. Um, to, to the transmission of a bunch of sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. Um, the challenge, of course, with some of those uh, methods, in particular condoms, is just that, uh, you know, it really relies on a, another person, perhaps, um, uh, putting on the condom, for example, or uh, being as invested in, in the use of that prevention tool as the, the person him or herself might be. Uh, PrEP changes all of that in a really dramatic and exciting way because it gives the person themselves the opportunity, the right to um, take control of their own health, to decide to use PrEP, uh, and it's something that they can do on their own without necessarily needing to disclose that to other people to, to protect themselves. Uh, and what's really exciting about it is, of course, that it's extremely effective. We know that if it's, if it's taken regularly, it can decrease the risk of acquiring HIV by almost 100%, uh, particularly in, in gay, bisexual, and other men of sex with men. Um, and it's also uh, really safe. So uh, fortunately, most people who take it don't have much in the way of side effects, and the toxicities are pretty, uh, pretty manageable and pretty, uh, pretty mild. So I think there's a number of uh, important challenges to accessing PrEP today in Canada. Uh, the first and, and most important one for, for many people in the country is, of course, just access to the drug itself. Uh, unfortunately, in this country, we don't have access to a, a universal pharmacare program, and so every jurisdiction, in particular every province and territory, has to come up with its own decisions around whether or not it's going to provide public funding for, for PrEP. And it's also worth pointing out, pointing out that even in the provinces of Quebec and Ontario where there is public funding for PrEP, uh, unfortunately there still is a de deductible that people have to pay for in order to buy into that plan unless they qualify under, under certain other mechanisms. Uh, which for, for many people, even though the cost is uh, much lower than it used to be uh, for, for the medication itself, the deductible itself can, can still be a barrier for many people. So first and foremost I think we have to think about the, the, the challenges with access to the, to the medication itself. Even if the issue of access to the drug itself is, is resolved, which is not a small feat for some folks, unfortunately, there's still other challenges that are relevant, things like accessing a, an appropriate provider. Um, and unfortunately, because PrEP is relatively new, uh, it still remains something that many you know, general practitioners, family physicians, uh, other frontline providers are just not that familiar with in many cases, uh, or even if they are familiar with it, not comfortable prescribing, uh, because it does involve prescribing an anti HIV medication and history Historically, that's been an area that you know has mostly been left to specialists. So uh, that's another area that we and others are trying to work on to try to raise awareness about this intervention, uh, how it works, so the providers themselves can be uh, more competent and comfortable providing this to patients. 
So our team has put together a set of clinical guidelines on PrEP and uh, NPEP, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, that came out uh, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, or CMAG, on, on uh, November 27th of 2017. It's divided into a number of different sections that talk about the indications for PrEP and NPEP, in other words, who should be on these, uh, as well as uh, what specific drug regimens should be used for PrEP and NPEP, because especially for NPEP, there are a number of different options out there. Um, and for, for PrEP, there have been a number of different drugs that have been studied, or a number of different ways of using PrEP medications that have been studied. So we come out and give some guidance on those issues based on the best available evidence. Finally, there's a bit of a section that talks about just practical advice for providers on the nuts and bolts of actually uh, prescribing this. What does it look like to monitor folks? Uh, what kind of frequency uh, should be done? What sort of screening for sexually transmitted infections would be indicated? And other sorts of general health measures that would be appropriate to, to provide to a person who is um, at an elevated risk of HIV acquisition, things around their sexual health like other vaccinations uh, and that sort of thing. So despite all of the progress that we've made in advancing PrEP and other biomedical prevention tools in Canada in, in the last while, I think there's still a ways to go. Uh, certainly, as we've already been highlighting, there's uh, a need for more access to the medication itself. We still have huge gaps across this country in terms of access to the medication and putting it onto public formularies so that it's as accessible as possible to as many people as possible uh, is really paramount. Uh, but in addition to, to that, we again need to work on awareness raising among uh, people who are potentially at risk, on providers uh, as well. Uh, we also need to, I think, monitor uh, the rollout of this. It's We're just at a point in Canada now where the, 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 the uptake of, of PrEP is, is just starting to really take off. Um, it's been taking off for a while now in, in the province of Quebec, and I think it really provides an, an important opportunity for us to, to study, to monitor this uh, very carefully, to make sure that we're really achieving the goals that we want to achieve. Of course, we really expect there to be dramatic decreases in HIV incidence. That's already been documented to be the case in other countries, which is really exciting. Places like uh, the United Kingdom, Australia have started to show declines in HIV infections related to PrEP uptake. Hopefully we'll see the same here. Uh, but there's also, of course, going to for a long time remain uncertainties around uh, what the relationship between PrEP use and the ongoing major epidemics of other sexually transmitted infections uh, is going to be. Uh, we've had epidemics of those other bacterial infections, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, even before PrEP came onto the picture. But we know that uh, those epidemics are, are not going away anytime soon, unfortunately. They're continuing to, to, to really be a problem. Uh, and we know that folks at PrEP are, uh, on PrEP are going to be at risk for acquiring S. STIs and exactly how that all plays out and the relationship between these two uh, really needs to be watched very carefully because those are major public health problems. Maybe the very last thing I'll say about where, uh, what's next for PrEP uh, overall, not just in Canada, uh, is where the field is heading. Uh, so uh, as we mentioned before, PrEP uh, is usually used in Canada to refer specifically to the use of this, this medication, uh, tenofovir with emtricitamine, uh, but the question remains whether or not there might be other forms of PrEP that could be used in the future as well. Right now, already, there's a clinical trial that's ongoing in Canada and other countries looking at a new formulation of tenofovir with emtricitabine. Uh, it's not appropriate to use it at this time in 2017, but uh, hopefully uh, the clinical trial results will become available in the next few years that will tell us whether that's an option as well. There's interest in injectable formulations. There's clinical trials looking at that, which might be an attractive option if it works for folks who aren't so keen on taking a medication or a pill uh, every day or, or or on demand. Uh, and of course, we're always interested in, in uh, the ideal kind of biomedical prevention strategy for HIV, which would be a preventative vaccine. It's not exactly PrEP, but it's um, something that would be you know, used with the same goal in mind. And the vaccine field continues to slowly move forward, and we're optimistic that that could lead to, to preventative measures in the future. I'm thinking about novel ways to actually implement the delivery of PrEP. So we've just been envisioning that of course all you need is a, is a, is a patient and a provider in the same room and, and then you can go ahead and prescribe the drug if, if the person has access. But that's easier said than done. And within our health system there's a lot of different uh, creative ways I think that we could start to think about delivering this 
in order to be able to deliver it at the scale that we need to achieve public health impact. So the types of things I'm thinking about are, are things like having more uh, nurses involved in delivering PrEP, and we're actually studying that in a program here in Toronto, and I know other centres are looking at that as well. In some parts of Canada, notably Alberta, it's actually possible for pharmacists to be involved in directly prescribing a medication that's, uh, that's, uh, that's clinically indicated. Uh, so looking at models of care that, that are based on pharmacists might be uh, really important as well. There's a lot of work and there's a lot of interest, I think, within community organizations to get involved in all kinds of roles, adherence support, awareness raising, um, helping people access uh, care, uh, all of those sorts of things uh, really need to be looked at. And all of this, you know, ideally sewn together in, in coherent public health policy. I think in this country we, we have a need probably for more uh, active, uh, outspoken maybe leadership on, on the topic of exactly how we're going to roll this out uh, at a population level from, from public health authorities and I think there's, there's, there's lots of opportunity uh, for people to get involved in all of that. Uh, in many cases, uh, individuals who might be able to really benefit from PrEP may not even be aware that it, that it exists uh, or may be aware of it and, and really not think it's maybe appropriate for them for whatever reason or safe for them. And I think we need to do a lot more in terms of providing uh, education uh, to, to folks uh, across the country in different uh, segments of society, uh, especially people who might not historically have as much access to, 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 uh, to health information, uh, to let them know that this exists, to help folks make their own informed choices about whether it's right for them, um, and also really importantly to help people understand their own level of HIV risk. Uh, people's risk for, for any health issue is something that's often hard for, for, for anyone to understand uh, accurately, and there's a lot of research that we and others have done that shows that oftentimes when people are at some elevated risk for HIV, they may not actually perceive that risk. And in many senses, uh, perceiving that one's not at risk of something, even though one is, is, is going to be a major risk factor for unfortunately that outcome actually happening, like, like an HIV infection actually happening. So awareness to, to folks who can benefit is another key piece. Uh, and then I think a final piece is really uh, back to the issue of, of making sure we have uh, educated, informed, and what I like to call culturally competent providers. So we know that a lot of um, providers are, again, not aware of PrEP, uh, not sure how to prescribe it or, or feel like it's someone else's job to prescribe it. We call that the, the purview paradox. People think it's not within their purview to, to be a prescriber. Uh, but in fact, because PrEP can be so straightforward and it is such a safe and effective intervention, it is something that we really think can be done by uh, and should be done by, by primary care providers. So we need to do more to get information into the hands of, of those providers as well so that they can help uh, link their patients into care.